First time? And maybe people are just arriving, so maybe uh, we give like 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. How are you doing, Lassan? How's your day been? Pretty good. I mean, only been up for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> same, man. Yeah. <laughs> Early starts, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we start? Oh, yeah, are we ready? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Sound and Music's Digital Lunchtime New Music Labs. Uh, I'm sorry we're a bit late today. Um, we had some technical difficulties before we came on. Um, but uh, my name's Sam, and I'm a member of Sound and Music's youth advisory group, New Voices. For those of you who don't know, Sound and Music is the national organization that supports the creation and enjoyment of new music. In 2021, following on from the first ever series of masterclasses in 2020, music, New Music Labs are the new series of free virtual labs with a twist. Each of these interactive sessions have, have been created with and will be delivered by one of us, the Youth Advisory Group. We brought together some of the most exciting professional composers, music creators and producers to share their experiences and expertise in order to inspire as many young people like us to enjoy making music, whatever stage they might be at. Those who might already be creating their own music, those who want to explore something new, and those who might never have tried. New Music Labs aim to provide all of these things and introduce you to an, a creative industry expert who will give you a taster of how they approach creating music. I'm really excited that Mellow Zed is joining us today. Together, today we're going to learn the basics of how to approach music production for video content. We will look at a snippet of video kindly provided by Omar Barchetta and discover how Mellow Z produces music for it. I will ask questions about the creative process and there'll be a chance for you to ask questions at the end. I'm sure you'll know the, the work of Mellow Z, but in case you don't, then Mellow Z is a South London born composer, producer and multi-instrumentalist. He's a multi multidisciplinary artist with work spanning music, design, work and painting and video. And I would now also like to introduce you to Aisha from the education team at Sound and Music, who is also joining our session and will be helping with the Q&A at the end. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping rules. The Q&A function will be available throughout so you can post your questions to the artist. If you have an unstable connection, you might find it improves if you switch off the video in Zoom and just listen to the audio. But that's enough from me. I'm now delighted to hand over to Mello Zed. Afternoon, guys. Pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to share. Um, yeah, let's just get into it. Okay, so I guess I'll start with uh, the video. Um, working kind of in video spaces, like with directors, is something that I think for a lot of producers is kind of foreign at first because like we're used to you know like beats or more kind of uh, incubated ways of making music and I think when I personally started working with uh, visuals it was definitely like a opener in terms of like how we make our music and how we think about music in a more maybe lateral way than before like I definitely had to open up my kind of vision in terms of all right well you know, you might think in terms of, you know, drums or getting something kind of sounding, you know, really big or whatever, but with the film stuff, it's more about serving the visual stimulus. Um, so yeah, like let's, let's watch the video. Um, so here's the a video by itself that I got um, kindly from Omar. So that was a really cool kind of scene to see, like a sort of carnival, uh, Notting Hill type vibe. Um, and I just felt like for me, like as a Caribbean person as well, like it was interesting to 
see how I can like interpret that and, and interpret some of the themes I know from that musically. So that like, that was the first thing I personally thought. So once I had, um, once I had a understanding of what the film was about and what the film was kind of trying to say to me, I started thinking about like, okay, cool. So Carnival, it's a very sensory thing, like the sounds. I got the, and first thing I did actually was go into my archives because I, I spend a lot of time doing um, field recordings. So like um, what I'll do is I'll just walk around dictaphone in hand, just recording the world. Like I think it's really important as producers that we like keep, keep like listening and recording for things because you never know how you can use things in music and and for me like using um found sound i guess is a big part of my practice uh so yeah so this is actually the recording that i took um that i took when i was at carnival myself um and i'll play that to you now It's like a mishmash of like different sounds and just like different kinds of cultures. And I just felt like, like using that in some way in this particular um, composition will be a useful and interesting kind of angle. Um, so yeah, then I kind of was, what I would usually do then is I take it from there. I took it and I put it into this thing called a uh, drum rack, um, which is like a sort of, MPC style uh, sampler, um, which allows you to kind of put the uh, sounds on on each um, on each pad, and then I was like, okay, cool. Like, how can I make this musical? So um, that's when I took the film um, and I got my guitar and just like wrote like a little kind of piece like this. I put that um, I kind of use that as the a basis to build the rest of the composition around. So um, I then kind of went back to my uh, found sound and I kind of got the key because that's in the key of E. So I don't know if you guys can hear actually, if I jump on like a, a demo guitar, I'll play it. Can you guys hear that? Cool. Yeah. So that was like the kind of first part of the thing I was like. And I just figured that the tempo of it as well was dictated by the fact that I know that soca music is like a big part of carnival culture. And the tempo of that is like 145, 150 BPM. And so I figured like, okay, well, how about I make something that is kind of at odds with what you would consider soca, which is very much like up-tempo, fast, kind of like party music, and then make something that is almost like the opposite feeling, but takes tropes of that kind of music. Um, and so the tempo that I got to, which you can see in the corner here, is 145, and that kind of dictated the the sort of uh, tempo, but then also when it comes to while I was playing, I guess it's very, you know, it's very um, tranquil, you know? Um, so that's kind of why that, why I kind of chose that tempo, which I guess looks like this. Looks like this kind of tempo. And usually the kind of music would be like dun, 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 dun. dun. That's not the kind of rhythm that you would normally hear from um, soca music. And I just figured like, it'd be interesting to play around with different approaches to that kind of rhythm. Um, so yeah, once I had that, 
um, I started to layer things, and that's where maybe we can we can mute this for now. Actually, and I'll play in a second. Um, So, some of those sounds that you heard, like there was a as a whistle, because obviously a whistle kind of thing is a big part of carnival. I sampled that and brought it. So, let's see. yeah, so this sound originally is this without any of the effects. Um, but then it's. Start. Um, yeah, it's um, pitched down like. 18, so originally it was here. And then I push it down to kind of being here. Put some effects on it. Uh, Valhalla Reverb, which I recommend anyone um, using. Uh, Valhalla Delay, and just create like a sort of more spacey type sound, um, which I think was quite cool. And then I kind of just had that so that it fit with what's going on in the music and, and almost kind of adds a kind of worldly feel to it. Um, and then just back to what I was saying before about using um, sound that I recorded, I then went back to the Notting Hill sound and I heard this thing, which I thought was interesting, and the horns. And I was like, okay, cool. So. I mean, I'm not a trumpet player, so I needed some kind of horn sound or something. How can I make this this sound musical? Um, and then I put it into that drum rack that I was telling you about um, here. Um, and sampled it and came out with this kind of thing. So like you can hear like it's it's almost doing a kind of melodic thing, but it's just two um, it's just two of the horn sounds uh, put together. Yeah, so it's these two here. So it's one of them's pitched up and one of them's down, and I just kind of like played around with that until I got something that was in key with what I was playing. Um, put this back there. Uh, and then, yeah, so I had like this sound, it was quite cool, like a sort of cool way to um, interpret some of the uh, found sound that I got from Carnival um, in this composition. Um, so if I play it with it in now. It's tough with what we have to do but so a lot of the time as well I like to look for cues um, with this one for example um, I was looking especially at this guy here and his movement um, unfortunately I can't show you at the same time as playing the uh, music but a lot of the small cues I like to look for so for example here where he turns around I'm looking at that to see how I can mirror that with the music. So like on that part there, um, I introduced another sound, which was this one here. These chords come in at that point when he kind of like um, starts to spin.
And then we also get this kind of idea, which almost kind of creates a heady feel, I guess, because a lot of the time, like, the sort of euphoria type feel of carnival is like a big part of it. So I was trying to mirror those small movements because it's quite a short video as well. Um, there's not a lot of time to necessarily uh, build, you know, different moves and stuff. Um, so I've had to look at the small movements and try and mirror those um, as best as I could. Yeah, so let's go back to this again. Um, if we look, and then at the end as well, like I think it's also very important. Let's see if you can see this. Can you guys see this visual? Um, clearly. Not so clearly? It's still a bit glitchy, but we can see it. Yeah. Okay, so um, the endings, I think, endings of uh, films or uh, pieces is very important. So I like to have some kind of mirrored parts. So the start of the composition has this kind of reversed um, drum sound to open up the um, chord progression. And then at the end as well, it kind of comes back as like a, end, like a sort of a punctuation point. Um, so if you see it. And, you know, because like a lot of directors like to have tail end to play with, like um, when you're working on things, usually it's never quite an exact science. It's always like, okay, cool. So because you often get edits last minute, you often get things changing. So I like to always leave room um, to have, you know, I guess, I guess different um, ending for things. So with this one, I felt like the air horn as well, like another sound that, that gave me the feel of like West Indian culture, uh, Jamaican culture, even though it felt at odds as well with the overall sound of the music, I feel like it works in a kind of, um, Melodic way. It's like usually like you hear DJ sets playing, you know, air horns and this kind of thing. And I just figured that it'd be quite cool to have that as like a melodic stroke in the in the piece. Um, I think as well. Effects wise. Um, there's things that I like to use. Guitar rig I use a lot, like especially when I'm writing things on guitar. Um, like I use mainly like electric uh, for the for the main guitar part. I use the classical guitar, which kind of gives a different, obviously, different texture, more um, hands-on kind of feel. I left that dry. Keep the kind of roughness to the sound. Um, so yeah, and then like another thing that to add. Using your voice, you know, the big thing, like it's something that as a producer, I think a lot of us can kind of sometimes um, sleep on like how, how useful it is to use our voice in our music. Because a lot of the time when we make something, especially if you're working with like artists or singers, for example, like you, we often hear the kind of um, the best thing for the music almost, even though like a lot of us are not singers, we often hear the best thing for the music. So. I like to use my voice in a lot of compositions and then uh, manipulate it in different ways, partly to hide the fact that I can't sing shit, but also to just kind of experiment. Um, so that kind of sound that you hear where it's like here. 
Jordan. It's just me uh, doing like a sort of Jordan. thing and then pitching one of them uh, up to five and then having the other one um, untransposed and then just putting some effects on it. Like I, I used um, this delay, which I've been enjoying. And they just kind of like there's a, there's so many different things you can do. Like I would, you know, maybe work <laughs> with something like the OTT. And if you change the time, you can just get different effects. And I just think it's important that as you know, um, composers, we look at as many different ways to engage with sound as possible. Um, and that's why like from the voice to the guitar, to the found sound, to the sampling of, of the uh, Notting Hill um, recording, it's all kind of, it all forms part of building the world, I guess, of what it is that you want to achieve with the film. And with this film, um, obviously, with it being kind of set in carnival and in that kind of vibe, I wanted to come at it from as many angles as possible to, you know, to sort of um, understand the world of the film as I see it. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, we just kind of do that to keep, um, to, to sort of keep it interesting as well, because, you know, like using a car horn as like a, instrument i guess is quite an interesting angle to come at things from um like with these kind of things um and moving it around so like whether it's that or whether it's so even something like this here could easily be like sampled as like a as an instrument, you know, and I think it's just important to view like a, have like a very lateral view of, of the sound and the options available to us, like as uh, writers, I think like, okay, cool, there's instruments and there's different things, but trying different kind of approaches always kind of brings about interesting, interesting outcomes, you know, and I think that's like the main um, that's one of the main things I like to do anyway, it's just keep things interesting and keep there being like a point of difference when it comes to the compositions that I write. Like it, it could very easily have been like a super like up-tempo, um, up-tempo kind of uh, tune that would maybe fit something like this that you'd think would maybe go with this. But I felt like kind of doing the opposite was a more interesting way of looking at it and um and yeah like a lot of directors really appreciate that kind of uh taking a visual and just making it your own in the best way that you can um because like everyone's got an idea i guess of, of of how they want something to sound but as a composer like we kind of take that responsibility and it's not it's not to be it's not to be um, obviously you work with a director and you kind of uh, speak about how you want things to be, but it's very much, you should try and take the lead in terms of, okay, well, I'm seeing this or I'm interpreting in this way. And then, like I said, using different kinds of sources to, to feed into how you um, interpret that sound. So yeah, that's pretty much the um, composition. It's quite a short uh, video. Um, but yeah, I, I'll play it again so you can listen to the whole thing in its entirety. Um,
So that is the, yeah, that's the composition. Um, was there anything that you wanted to like ask about anything, Sam? Or yeah, I was actually wondering. Uh, the, so the first time you were watching the video, did you sort of did you make notes? Because you said about um, the man turning around and that um, you wanted something to change there. Did mm-hmm. you sort of make notes of like a time that um, for each thing to happen? Because I can see like the time scale at the bottom there. Yeah. Many like hit points where you needed stuff to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like. Um... It's just a shame that it's not so clear for you guys when I'm when I'm playing our tables, but if you can see so what I do is as I'm recording, I'll I like to play things kind of like live and then move them around. So mm. once I um like for example where he's moving, let's try and find that part. Um Okay, so here, yeah, so as he's turning, I try and hit it so that each kind of note goes around, like, as he's kind of like hopping on one leg type thing. Um, So usually I would like, on a longer video, add like markers and um, like a... so I just do something like this, add locator, and then just put like turn or something. And then I'll be able to see, okay, well, this is where I need this to come in and I need him to, or I need the music to mirror his action. Um, but because I kind of made this, like while watching the uh, video, I just <laughs> saw where I needed to kind of play things and just added those textures. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, how how do you record in the instruments that you that you write? Like um, because I know probably a lot of the people on on here watching um are getting into this sort of music production. Yeah. And I know when I was getting into, it, I didn't really have um lots of hardware and stuff to like plug in things. Did yeah. You just did you start by just recording things in like with a computer or with your phone or something? Or did um, you have? Did you buy stuff to uh, to record in your guitars and stuff? Yeah. So for a long time, bro, I was using like I was using just my laptop and like a sound card. I had like a, a Focusrite, um, Focusrite sound card, um, and yeah, that's all I was really using. Um, and as I kind of learned more and kind of grown more, I've been able to understand. Okay, cool, like. Um, now I use like a Focusrite um, preamp, which I plug my guitar into. Um, but I like to keep things simple. Like I really, like I'm not, when it comes to equipment, I think I'm very much sound orientated. So like where I find something that I feel like sounds good, um, I'll use that regardless of like the cost or like of like the spec of the gear kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so like, it's really like just my audio interface, the preamp and then my guitar. Um, I occasionally use like hardware instruments. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like getting more into that recently because the texture that you get, I guess, from hardware instruments is like a bit more of a analog realer type feel, uh, yeah. which, which I guess is, you know, like. Um, cool but it also just really depends on what 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 you're after because I know for example that with manipulation of sound like um, for example if I pull up something like a mini moon um, which is should open up here um, okay this is the uh, VST version but you know you can get some really cool outcomes if you mess around with it in certain ways, like say RC20, uh, which is something that a lot of people use now. It's like a retro color um, thing and you can just add like different textures to it. So like even something like this, just kind of adds a bit more of like a more analog texture, I guess, which is what people are uh, chasing with using hardware, you know? 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I definitely keep things simple when it comes to um, when it comes to sort of what I use, the instruments I use, how I use them. Um, but I definitely do like to get out of the box. Uh, you know, I think it's important as a producer and as a composer that we have, like I said, like a lateral understanding of 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 how we how we're approaching music and how we're um, writing music. And I think sometimes, especially for me, um, coming from more of a production uh, beat making background, um, getting out of the box was a big thing, just in terms of all right. So yes, you've got these VSTs. Yes, you've got you know, all the things on the laptop, but it's also important to try and, um, you know, to like try and use, I don't know, like more audio or like I said about the um, voice thing, like using your voice just in weird, interesting ways that can kind of create outcomes that are not as scripted, you know? Um, yeah. that's, that's a real kind of big part, I think, of, of that. Um, but yeah, Let's see if there's... was there anything else that 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 um, you were asking as I was going along, or that you wanted to know as I was going along? Um, well, the uh, I I thought it was really um, interesting that you um, use recordings from your actual life because yeah. I know as well as using your sort of um, ideas and experiences. Yeah. Um, to change the way that you write um, using the actual um, recordings from places you've been. Mm. It really made it more personal. Like what, um, what, why, why did you decide to just start taking a microphone around with you and recording <laughs> sounds? Um, I think, I think part of it is just my character. Part yeah. of it is just the fact that like, I think as a composer, as a producer, um, I guess I'm just obsessed by like collecting sound and by just finding interesting things within just the world that can be musical. Um, you know, like I personally think that you can make music out of everything and anything. So like having something on me all the time that can just uh, record, I guess, all those things is just, I think, uh, it's like a yeah like it's just necessary for me as like a, a writer and i think people making music should always have you know whether it's an idea that you get like um in the park or in a in a random place just having access to somewhere where you can record things and ideas is always like super important um and i picked up some really interesting things like conversations or bits of conversations and then sampled those in songs or, or, or um, like, see if I can pull something up actually now where I've got that, where I've kind of done that. Um, like, for example, I'll take this. And as well, sometimes the texture of when you record things by like dictaphone or even iPhone, it's a, like, it's a, it creates a vibe in itself. Yeah. You know, like, I think sometimes we can be caught up on like the perfect sound or cleaning something up so much. But for me, it's like, you can really get some interesting outcomes when you leave the, like leave some of the mess in, um, you know, like a lot of the, artifacts here from this sound. You just kind of the overall sound of like ambience, I guess. I left in with this composition because I knew that it would add to that feel, I guess, of, of, of immersiveness of being in the place, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, man, I definitely, I definitely, um, I definitely feel like that whole uh, found sound thing is, is a really big part of, of uh, composition especially making like a database I guess of the sounds random sounds that you don't even know when you actually need them but it's important to just have them so that 
you know, you can not be locked into any kind of one way of creating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you're commissioned to do something like this, like when you're given a video and mm. someone wants you to write some music for it, do you go out and sort of try and experience what's in the video? Like if it was in some woods, would you go to some woods and like have a look around and start recording stuff or would you already have all the recordings you ever needed? Yeah, I mean, um, I like to think I've got a few, but if it was to do something like that, then I think I definitely, I definitely try and um, have some personal experience or connection, I guess, with what I'm trying to write for. So yeah, like whether it's just finding somewhere that in some way uh, reflects what it is that I'm writing, like I'm writing about, and just try and I guess um, immerse myself as much as I can in that, like in the world of what the film is. Um, like I did one film that was about like West African music um, and literally for a month before I even started touching any instrument, I was just, everywhere I went, I was just listening to like uh, Fela or, you know, Tony Allen, these kind of players who um, wrote that kind of music. And it just kept me into that world, like when I was going for a run or on the train, just, I was just locked into that world. And I feel like um, the more that you can immerse yourself in the world of the film, it allows you to have more of a marriage between, I guess, your music and then the uh, visual, which is the most important, I guess. Let's see if we can the question. Hey, this is a nice question. I was wondering what sort of videos you write for, what sort of I guess I should answer these afterwards, right? Or should I, I guess I can answer it now? Um, wondering what sort of videos you write for, what sort of commissions you get in your commission notes. Yeah, so in terms of uh, videos I write for, I'm kind of open to be honest with you. Like, I think a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is based on, I guess, my music as a producer and like an artist. Um, people hearing that and thinking, okay, cool, this might work for my video. But I personally have an interest, like a very deep interest in um, visual arts. Uh, I paint, like there's, I think the style of things that I kind of gravitate towards, which uh, focuses on, you know, maybe uh, more avant-garde type art forms. Um, I, I feel like I sort of naturally gravitate to those kind of things. Um, let me just answer that. Okay, I don't know what to do here. Um, yeah, but um, I guess I'll answer that at the end. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, that's probably probably um was there anything else that you wanted to ask about anything or uh, i will just say now that um well thank you for uh, a really fascinating session it was really inspiring and um yeah i particularly loved um you how you brought in your experiences from life and recordings from your actual personal life to make the music even more personal yeah and um, yeah, so if, if anyone has um, some questions, I'll keep asking questions while you're typing yours out. But the Q&A function is open now and Aisha is going to field uh, the questions. So um, the software you use is Ableton, right? Yes, yes, yes. Would you recommend that to someone starting out or would you say that's a bit higher level? Um, I feel like, so I started on GarageBand yeah um, like, right right at the beginning i had a i remember i had this computer that only had garage brand on it no internet nothing else just garage brand um and i just had to learn how to like kind of use it and layer things and whatever um and then moved to logic for a little bit um and i guess because of circumstance i didn't have a mac at the time 
And I just started using Ableton and then just kind of just really enjoyed it basically and just didn't look back. Um, I wouldn't say it's more complex. I'd say it's a bit more, um, you can kind of get into the sound a bit more. So there's a lot more options to tweak things, I think, and like be more kind of clinical in how you approach. Yeah. Um, did you teach yourself how to use the software or did you sort of go on YouTube and find videos on it? I taught myself, man. I taught myself. But really? I say that, but I also spend a lot of time just on YouTube um, watching videos of like tips and tutorials about how to extend that knowledge because like a lot of the time it's easy to get locked into how you work and you know the, the way that you do things or the way that you uh the way that you like make music and i think sometimes extending that knowledge constantly is a good way to keep the creative options as open as possible which i think is like the most one of the most important things about writing music um so I like to always kind of, yeah, just be learning new things about my software that I don't know. Even like with other people, like when I work with my friends or other producers and other um, writers, and they might show me something that I just had no idea about, you know, um, which is really interesting. Like there's this feature on Ableton where you can, um, you can play around with like the transients um of a sound so if i get for example so i get these drums here so these drums here and then if i walk that and then Transient. I learned this actually last week. So put this up to here and turn this all the way down. You can kind of take away a lot of the artifacts from from the sound. And I think it's quite interesting to play around with things like that. And how much you let back in again. And things like that, that's just a, like one thing that I picked up recently from a friend. Um, and I guess just through like collaboration, I guess you learn more things about what it is that you use, you know? Um, but I guess you use Logic, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely great for recording. I think it's really great for like recording audio, recording things. But for me, like I just personally struggle to get my head around it when it comes to creating on it. But I still yeah. kind of use the, logic format because yeah yeah well I've, I've always sort of used the um instruments and just recorded them into well i started on garage fan like you um and i guess logic sort of a graduation up from it because it's you know it's made by the same people it's the same sort of experience just it's a bit yeah. more complicated and you can mm. do more things with it but yeah I, i've i've given ableton a few tries it's definitely it's a different experience yeah 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 it is, um, it is. is it but it's um it makes you write in a different way, I think. And um, I think it's probably, um, it's a good idea for people to try out different softwares, even if they're stuck in one at the moment. Yeah. Just to just to give a go um, on other ones, because it will make you write differently from how you're used to, just because you don't know the new things that are in the new software. It's interesting you say that, actually, because I've been at a writing camp um, just last week, and a lot of the guys there were using like FL Studio, for example. Mm. Um, which I think is great for like drums and like and percussion, but then there's other things that like Ableton kind of does a bit better. So like collaborating across um, softwares is a really good way to just get the best sound basically, you know, like and get the best outcomes. Like I think that's got to be the focus when it comes to writing. It's just trying to get the best outcome, however that is, and I think like even even not necessarily using Ableton all the time, but like having like a passing knowledge of it could be useful just to be able to kind of get some of the benefits out of it wherever they are, you know. Um, and yeah, so I, I just I'm a big advocate for that, you know, just working across 
working across software is to get whatever the music needs, whether that's some people even use music on their iPhone. Um, so I use um, Gary Brand on like an iPad. Like I know, like, I don't know if you know um, Steve Lacey. He like writes a lot of stuff just on his iPad, you know? So you know, there's just different ways to approach um, writing music, I guess. Uh, and it's important to be as open as possible to those different approaches um, as much as as much as you can be, you know? Yeah, so um, you uh, d is most of what you write now for video or do you do um, a lot of just music for music? So it's a mix. Like I think, um, I think writing for video, I've probably been doing it for the last three years, probably uh, full time, you know? But before that I was writing for artists, I was doing, you know, um, production work. And I try and keep the two of them kind of balanced. Like, um, I will always, I feel like I'll always produce for artists. I always write music in that sense. But the film stuff, I think it's the, it's what gives me life. I feel like it, it's just very much aligned with how I view music, how I approach music. So, I try to kind of keep things balanced, but it ends up moving more towards the film side, I, like I would say. Yeah. Um, which I'm not complaining about at all. To be fair. And how did you sort of discover writing for films? Did you wait? Because I know um, you, you do uh, video work yourself. Did you yeah. sort of start making videos and then decide to make some music for it? Or were you like asked to do it by friends? Yeah. Like so. I kind of got into it through relationships and I guess just um, nurturing certain relationships with people who I thought were interesting and did interesting work. Um, and then, you know, I guess through that, when they were writing films where they were um, putting things out and they kind of needed music for it, I just put myself forward as like, hey, cool, you know, I can do this, even though at the time I couldn't probably do it. I just said that I could do it because I wanted to push myself to say, okay, cool, this is something I'm interested in. How can I like, how can I um, get into it? Because, you know, there's not really like a route. It's not like, a, you know, I went to a school for composition or anything. It was like a thing of, okay, cool, well, I want to do this. How can I find the inroad, you know? Um, and for me, it was relationship. And there still is relationships like through, okay, so you do one job, people love it and then other filmmakers see that and then see your name with the credits or see your you know um see what you've done and it's like okay cool like let's get him to do this or let's you know and it kind of just snowballs like when you keep on nurturing those relationships with uh, filmmakers and and these kind of things um and it can be very natural you know like i think having a good relationship with the uh, directors of these films is really important because I guess it's like a team, you know? So you have uh, the um, director who's kind of your main point of call, but you guys have to speak often in order to, you know, get get the sound that you need. Because like I was saying earlier, while you do have the like responsibility, I guess, to take charge of the music and put your, uh, put your kind of uh, vision on it, it's also important that you're kind of able to um, communicate those ideas back and forth with the um, director who's obviously the person writing the film so it's like being aware of that balance is like a sort of team uh team approach is also like super important i would say yeah i think in in the music industry i mean obviously i'm not in the music industry i'm still quite young but my parents are um they're both sound engineers and I think a lot of how it works is basically just sort of word of mouth. Just, you just make a good impression and people yeah, like it. you and then that's you'll it. get more work. Because you, you don't like, I mean, as a sound engineer, you don't have like telemarketing adverts, adverts or like a billboard or anything. It's just yeah. like someone will say to someone, oh, this person was good. Yeah. Or, or they'll hear some of what you do and ask who you are and then you'll get more work. I think it, 
it's just like you should just treat like every piece that you write as an advertisement for yourself yeah because uh, I, I completely think, agree yeah I completely agree because like I said for a lot of people there's not there's not like a you know it's not like okay here's the clearing to just be a composer like a lot of composers I speak to get into it from completely different angles some of them come in, like from the, the classical world you know they've been in orchestras and they uh, get into it that way I came more from like electronic um, and like uh, production world so I guess yeah like it's just important to nurture relationships and be as um, be as open to different things as possible you know like uh, different kinds of um, film different kinds of people and I just think that's like the most important thing it's very much a it's very much a people's profession I feel like that's one thing that I found in the last few years anyway like about relationships and about like how to nurture those so that like the work and the music and the film is as great as possible and it does pay off really yeah can I jump in and ask a quick question? Sure, uh, sure, sure. To both Z and maybe Sam. Yeah, it was really interesting for me to watch your music because I passed on the video to you originally and I was really, I didn't know what to expect, how you would interpret it. And when you were speaking earlier about import, like kind of putting your vision to the clip, it was interesting because you were putting your vision with the sonics. Mm. And this is, I guess, is an interesting by nature like producing music for video is a collaborative process where you are you can be very subjective about what that piece gives to you and you go away with it yeah. and i just wondered how has it opened up for you to see new ways of seeing footage or the world around you by has it happened to you that you took something away from the clip provided but the intentions of the maker was entirely different it would be very interesting to hear how that collaboration and dialogue changed and shaped you. And similarly, uh, Sam, I don't know if you had the chance to watch the video, but was it what I you did, expected yeah. in terms of what Melo Z has produced? So it could be really interesting to kind of tie it back to the visuals in that sense. You know, if I hadn't heard your music before I saw the video, I wouldn't have expected that at all. But because mm -hmm. um, you, I know, so the video, it certainly seemed um, sort of, upbeat but listening to your music before um like because i've been listening to it over the couple of months that we've been um uh, talking about you um and i you know it's sort of i it's obviously it's not exactly what i expected but i i've come to sort of realize that you don't know what what you're expecting with your music it's sort of um it's quite free and it's not like overly structured. It's sort of just, it goes where the video goes. Like a video doesn't have a structure. It doesn't, it has a start, but it just starts. And yeah. I think that's the sort, same sort of thing with your music. It's not got like an introduction and like um, an ending and like a climax in the middle. It's just got a sort of a flow. Um, and that that is sort of, um, yeah, it, I I guess I was kind of expecting what I heard, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. That's like, um, I think that's part of the reason why, like, I got into this whole film thing, because I guess with that flow, it's like, it, it suits uh, visual media a lot, because, like, I think um, sometimes with uh, commercial music, obviously, we do need that introduction uh, middle ending thing and i think with uh, film you're more open to just respond and i think that's like the kind of key thing that i like to uh, do in music but aisha your question um sorry yeah can you just um repeat the last part of your question just you know, quickly so i can remember yeah i will try to be more concise as well because there's another question <laughs> in the chat so and we've got a few minutes left um i guess i was interested in any anecdotal evidence where what you understood from the video provided for you to make audio uh, was different or in any way kind of um, to what the intentions of the video maker was and how that dialogue shaped you and how has it been important for you in your growth? Have you been able to see 
the world around you or the sounds around you differently because knowing that there's another perspective that the video uh, maker might have provided you with which you weren't aware before i don't know yeah. I hope that is a bit clear yeah, yeah, yeah. um so it's interesting because obviously i didn't i didn't actually know what omar's kind of intention was behind that video so i was very much going into it thinking okay well i'm gonna have to i actually watched it twice so i watched it once on mute and once with the sound underneath it and it's almost like when you watch the video without any sound, any of the sound from the actual um, recording, it gives you so much more space to think for yourself about ways to take it. And that's when I kind of thought about this whole thing of, okay, cool, let me just not make something that is super up tempo and like, you know, more like what the natural sound is of the video, I guess, that was in it. And then make something that I guess, um, is at odds with that in some way. Um, so yeah, like, I think appreciating the, the perspective of the, the uh, filmmaker, but then also saying to yourself, okay, cool, like, well, I can still interpret this. And often that comes from watching the video on mute, like sometimes um, directors will send you things with like, temp sound or something that they put on it. And I think it's useful to listen to that, but it's also, it's also useful to just watch it and see where your mind kind of goes naturally um, and listen to that as well. Uh, so yeah, I have to answer the question a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And it would be interesting to share the sound finished piece if you would like it with Omar and the original video yes. and see what he says. And we can also email the attendees and Sam yeah. to kind of hear that back, which could yeah, be very sure. interesting. Sure, sure, so sure. in the last um, minute or two, there's a question from Judith. Um, so basically uh, there was, you mentioned that you've learned a lot of stuff on your own or watching YouTube. So are there any uh, particular channels or accounts that you would recommend to beginners like who are into producing music for uh, vi visual material or more advanced composers as well? So what I would really recommend is Spitfire Audio. Um, really good company that make like plugins. Um, they've got the string emulator. So on this computer, I don't have it on this one, but on my other one I do. It's a um, strings emulator that kind of gives you the sounds of like violin, um, cello, all these different orchestral sounds. And if like it's been recorded so like meticulously that it's just perfectly like accurate. Um, they've got a really nice piano sound and those are free, that's a free resource as well. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out. I use that a lot in a lot of compositions I use that. Um, so uh, Spitfire Audio Labs is called. Um, and yeah, so it's like a sort of plugin uh, database that is really useful. Um, when it comes to other things for composition, um, on the more pricier side, like things like Keyscape, um, it's a really good like array of different um, key sounds. Um, what else would I use? Uh, I used to use Omnisphere a lot, but I guess that's a bit more, I find it a bit, overwhelming because it's like so many different sounds. It's quite a big plugin with a lot of different sounds. Um, but yeah, the ones that, for starting out, I definitely recommend Labs Spitfire. Yeah. Sounds great. I think okay. that, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, well, thank you everyone for your interesting questions. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this uh, New Music Lab as much as I did. Um, it's been really great. Um, we would love to know exactly how much you enjoyed it. Um, and so uh, Sound of Music um, are going to be sending out a uh, short online questionnaire. Um, and um, there'll be a poll there on the screen um, to let us know exactly how much you enjoyed it. And on the questionnaire, um, that's just to find out um, uh, what about it you enjoyed and um, how our sound of music can support young composers and music creators. Uh, so if you could spend five minutes completing it, it would 
be great to have that information. Um, if you'd like to find out more about our events, educational opportunities and programmes, then uh, please go to our website, www.soundandmusic.org. Um, thank you all again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you, Mellow Z. No worries, it's an absolute pleasure.